welcome to. Uh, why am I screaming? I don't know. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> Every time. I love that. It's me on the phone. Hey, welcome to bed. <laughs> and uh, not quite sure what to do with my hands. Um. Welcome to Basement TV. My name is Albert Chambers. I'm Kayla Winter. And welcome to Couch Sessions. What's Couch Sessions, you say? Couch Session is basically for engineers, producers, songwriters that work in studios that have qualms about talking about the frustrations of working alongside themselves and artists. Though this is a safe space for engineers and everyone else in the industry alike, I think it's also a space for us to make opportunity for clients, both present and future, to see a little bit of what we do, what can be expected, what not to expect, what's normal, what's not so normal. And my name's Anthony, and uh, I'm a, uh, you know, I'm a songwriter, producer, sound engineer, sound designer. I mean, if, you know, all the, whatever you want to call me, you can call me whatever you want. Just don't call me late to dinner. Call him daddy. Don't, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Only sometimes, and if you pay enough. And, uh, and I'm here, and I'm, and I'm here with, uh, with these two lovely people, and we're going to talk some shit, I guess, some mad shit. But it's not going to be, like, super bad. Like, it's not, it's not talking shit. It's like therapy, right? Mm -hmm. It is therapy. It's therapy, and we just want to let y'all know that you're not alone in, in what you're going through as a creative. This is, like, the hardest industry to, to make it in as a, as a, as a creative I think so. I think yeah. <laughs> I think one of the things in the introductory was and the description was what to expect and what not to expect when you go into a studio. Mm -hmm. If you're an artist and all of a sudden you um, want to record a song, mm -hmm. do you need an engineer? Do you need a producer? Do you even know how the process works? There, there are a lot of um, expectations, mm -hmm. I should say. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing... So this is a safe space where we want to be able to talk about things that grind our gears, uh, sometimes things that we don't really want to express. We don't want to upset anybody, but this is a safe space. You know what grinds my gears? Tell us, Kayla. Yeah. We're talking about needing engineer or not needing an engineer. Mm. I think that for people who are not in this industry or maybe who are getting their first fresh start... They seem to think that this is, a lot of people seem to think that this is something super easy that everybody can do. Right. And as a studio manager, you know, who's running the studio and making sure that all of them are equipped the way that they need to be to help and facilitate everybody, I often get artists coming in who book a recording session stating that they don't need an engineer because they know what they're doing. And what ends up happening is that I or whoever else is working is scrambling to manage the bands and also help that person in the studio because they have zero idea what they are doing yeah. at all. Like, I think it's just ignorance. They think that it's yeah. super, super simple. I mean, we talk about this all the time um, about people and they contact you, I know, especially for this, just to like make me an easy beat. It only takes a few minutes, mm, right? My right. favorite word, beat. Yeah, right? Mm. Make me a beat like I'm a beat maker, dog. Mm. Like, I, mm -hmm. like I'm in the garden pulling out beats. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like I'm not a, I'm a composer. No, that sounds like an ego uh, thing. But yeah, no, it's, it's just, I think people look at, if you look at all of the media surrounding like, like, any any artist, you know, any promo, it's like the what? Like Drake gets into the studio, spits like the sickest freestyle, and then they walk out. Like they don't know that like how much shit went mm. into that before that. They think you come in and it's mm. gold every time and that's just smooth sailing. And not just they, that, but how many hours the person behind the desk is crying because the mix is not perfect exactly. yet. Exactly. They don't understand that there's mixing engineers. They don't understand that there's rehearsals and there's musical directors for your show. They don't understand mm -hmm. that like there's a whole, it's a music industry, mm -hmm. right? It's not a, it's not like a little thing. There's a literal apparatus of people that are working from the top to the people that are tearing down Huge team. shows. Huge you know what I mean? That are all a part of the team. And I think that people don't realize that. And then there's the ego mm -hmm. of people who are like, I want to do it myself. Like, I don't, I don't need a producer. I don't need a songwriter. I don't need a lyricist. That's where the expectations and the limitations <laughs> collide. Right. Yeah. Right? Because they're literally limiting themselves to... Uh, not even a handful of people, 
literally themselves and maybe an engineer, and they expect that engineer to be able to help them with their arrangements, make sure the recording is on point, make sure the mix is on point, wherever they're sending it to mastering, make sure that's on point, make sure the songwriting is on point, make sure the lyrics are on point. They need help with everything. Even beyond that, I've had people ask me about being their distributor. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. Then it, it goes all thing. the way into d- actual actual distribution. Now the, the the thing is, is that they don't realize that the people that they're aspiring to be like are surrounded, like you said, with a team. But not only that, um, hundreds of songs to pick from, mm-hmm. and they come in with one song, and I, I sc- I'll scream it till the cows come home. These people believe that that one song is what's going to make it for them. And the first thing that I mentioned to them is, please don't be doing this for any return. Do this because you love it. Do this for the love of the music. Please do not expect anything out of this. And I don't want to make it sound like because I'm going to fail you. I just want you to be realistic of what you're going up against. Do you think that you see this across genres or are there specific oh, genres that you see all a lot genres. in? All genres. Yeah. I don't all genres. The thing is, is that some of them do have an it factor. Mm-hmm. Do they need polishing? Yeah. Always. Yeah, sure. Sure. Which, yeah, you should have always. teams of people. Once to again, help you like with that. and I love and I love that like, like you brought up the polishing because it's the same thing with like if ever you've recorded an artist, then you then you have to put auto-tune on their voice, like a singer in particular, yeah. and they're like, I don't want auto-tune. It's like, babe. Ariana Grande has fucking auto tune on her voice, and her voice is incredible. Yeah, everybody is getting everybody. is going through vocal correction, so you always need polishing. No matter how good you are, there's always that because, and they always need polishing. And they ask you, they ask, why do I need auto tune on my on my vocal? Because it's become such a standard now that it's become part of the sound. So part of the sound doesn't mean the effect of auto tune, but being perfectly in pitch is part of the sound. Yeah. If you would have listened to a, a record uh, 23 years ago, uh, 25 years ago, and you hear somebody going off a little off, you, you know, yeah. it's, oh, that's a little, it sounds a little bizarre to somebody that's listening to contemporary music. And sure. At Led Zeppelin, all of their like, discography. <laughs> there are a lot of right? people, um, you know, maybe of like the generation, you know, before mine, before that, and they'll say that music sounds different now it, you'll hear like you know music isn't the way that it used to be do you think that that's a contributing factor into it of course it's yeah. all part of the, the, the technology the, the technology has changed the way records are made so everything's everything's changed but the way you produce music m- drums are s- quantized on the grid mm-hmm. everything's super tight everything's super tuned there is no fluctuation in time so of course it's going to have a sound, there's going to be an aesthetic to it that's embedded in that music. So then what happens after that? People want to mimic that. Do you think that this, you know, this idea of like, this is the song that's going to make me, do you think this is an old idea or do you think that with the, um, the surge of, you know, TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, do you think those are contributing to that idea? I definitely believe that in the past, if you were a creator, you were actually fed by the label, we are going to develop you. Mm-hmm. Right. So this is not going to happen overnight. The first record, if it does great, awesome. Then that means the next record has to do better. And then we're going to continue that process and we're going to tour and we're going to put you on the road and we're going to like, we're going to grind, grind your teeth. Now, the thing is today, it's instant, instant um, gratification that yeah. they need, but it's also a lot quicker to be, you know, basically posting and distributing your content across the world. Right. Right. It's what, like a, it's a give and take. It's like the, the curse and the, uh, I don't know what the opposite of a curse is, but blessing a blessing and a blessing. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Damn. Is your life okay? English is hard. <laughs> so yeah, it's a curse and a blessing of like, you have all of this, this, the potential to to do all of this stuff yeah. and to produce like because thirty years ago, forty years ago, I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to afford to to make music. You know, spending ten thousand oh, no dollars to, no. to to do an album like no. that was the entry fee. So that no one was coming around fucking around in the studios. You that's know? right. Because that's ten thousand dollars. So I think the technology makes it so that people are not only able mm-hmm. to 
just make stuff super easy without them understanding actually what it used to take. And also they're looking at the lottery winners. Oh, look at this one person who like made his first song, put it online and it blew up. Like if you want to, it's like, how do you want to become rich? You mm -hmm. want to start your own business or do you want to play the lottery? Because the lottery will get you rich, but it's not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Start your own business. You know, try your, you know, I think the lottery, that's an interesting term, the An lottery orange. winner. Um, we were speaking uh, to a few guests this week and they were talking about, you know, the machine that is the music industry. And it seems that even if you win the lottery, sometimes it's not exactly what it seems because you might get that one single and then that gets pumped out and pumped out and then people get tired of it and then they start to also forget about you. And now we're just going to sign the next person that sounds enough like you, but isn't you. And we'll right. push that instead. Mm. <sighs> There's so much focus on likes and followers. Consume, consume. Consume, consume, sound bites, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. I think people are thinking less about the actual real content that they're supposed to be creating. Yeah. Songwriting, storytelling, w w you know, I, I don't understand how it takes you a year to be in the studio and promoting a song that hasn't come out yet. If you want to, and this goes back to what we were saying before about expectations and people coming in and understanding, it's like, if you want to take this seriously as what you're doing, if you want to actually be an artist, then you got to treat it like an art. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You got to treat the product like an art and you're writing music and you got to take it seriously because if you're not taking it seriously at the very, at the very minimum, treating it like the piece of art that it is. Sure. Put some respect on that art. Yeah. Like, come on, you know, put some respect on my name. <laughs> so talking about art and songwriting, yeah. <laughs> question for you. When I was, you know, coming up and I was playing in bands, of course, like we wrote our, all of our own songs. And I can't imagine doing it any other way. Now, I know that nowadays, and we've spoken about this, there are teams of people who are writing for artists. Sure. When you were coming up, was that still the case? Or were artists more, like, directly involved in their art? Was it written by the band, by the singers? Or were there also huge teams of people doing it for them? When I was coming up, there were, there were no producers because nobody had the technology to have a studio within their facility. Mm -hmm. Everybody still had to go out and rent that studio that cost a $500 to $1,000 a day. Right. So no, the band was the band creating the music, and there was always one person in the band that took more direction than any mm -hmm. anyone else, and that was usually the producer in the band. Because music used to feel much more personal to me, and I think that's why I'm still like, when you ask me like your favorite eras, I'm always saying like 80s and 90s, because I felt like through the music, I knew who these people were. Sure. It's and interesting that you... Nowadays, yeah. I... I I don't know. I feel like the 80s and 90s is when it started becoming productionalized really? like that, where they started turning, especially with the hair metal bands, where they were just like fucking cranking out fucking what's the next, you but know they were I mean? still writing that stuff. I mean, like Motley Crue was still writing right. all of their but own stuff. But I think that was they like were, the seeds. Of yeah, but they were still writing, but they still had writer producers, mm -hmm. you know, Slowly, but sure. working with the labels in conjunction with the bands. They, they literally had a producer right. that was working on the songs and crafting the songs with the with the bands. They would go into the studios for three months to six months. Mm -hmm. And that's right. where the records were, were born. Right. I remember someone once told me, uh, the music industry <laughs> died. Real music died. This is obviously someone who's jaded and older. Uh, the music industry died when A&Rs and record label heads stopped being musicians and started becoming shoe salesmen. The tops of the industry, most of them don't know a lick about music. Right, so it's just, what's gonna make me the most money? How yep. are we gonna make sure that there's an ROI on this song that I made? The, the easiest way to get an ROI is to get 15 really talented people in a room. You're always gonna create something that's at least a bop at yeah. the very bare minimum. Yeah. It's, it's, it's literally just a money thing. Yeah. And that's the and that is the um, that's the the curse and the and the thing because we were saying you know like all you need to do to be a producer is to have a, a laptop in your room with a preamp and a mic which has made it so that it's saturated but there is and I'll fucking I'll fight you if you say this oh there's no good music nowadays have you been looking at the fucking Spotify's have you been looking because there's good music coming out every day oh, everyone yeah. is it's so democratic yeah. now everyone can make music and 
Sure, it's not getting on the radio. Sure, well, it's not going. that's the thing. Going... Maybe we should be specific is where is the good music coming from? Right. It's coming from a lot of the times, like you said before, sometimes it's people who don't know what the fuck they're doing. They're just, they got something to say and they got an emotion. So that's the blessing. Mm -hmm. The curse is that as a, if you're a producer who's like, who's trying to learn to be a part of the industry, you're almost like needing to mimic bad music mm -hmm. so that you can fit into the mold. Once, I, once again... <laughs> The, the technology changes and shifts the way music sounds and feels. So if all of a sudden people are now putting out records that were recorded and, you know, uh, it, it doesn't matter if it's a project room. There are amazing records made, put out in project rooms. But if it's made with somebody that doesn't understand how things are supposed to, to work, sometimes they push buttons and haphazard Oh, that's actually a really great mistake. I don't know what I'm doing, but holy crap, does that sound good? And a lot of like guys would actually say, I don't know how they get like Fruity Loops to have their kicks like so loud. They're just and they're pushing and it's red lighting, and but they're not clipping the, the converter. It still sounds good. They're not looking at the meters. They're just trusting right. their ears and they're going on feel. But that's what you got to do. There is no like, there is no recipe yeah. to make something good. You're not making biscuits, right? Yeah. You're making, you're making music, you're making art. So if you can't trust your ears, if you don't know, and that goes back to the whole producer sure. things. Producers, sure. like you said, like Rick Rubin, they just trust their ear. They just really. They trust their, their gut. They trust right. the feeling. It's not even a question of like their ear. They, they trust how it makes them feel. If it is true then why, like, I mean, is mainstream its own, like, beast? Because a lot of the stuff that's mainstream it just kind of follows a recipe and it sounds all the same. Yeah. So how much heart is in that and how much of, like, gut is in that if it's kind of, it just feels like it's getting peddled out? It is. It is. It's basically just cash. You know what I mean? Like, you can't, I was talking with someone the other day who's like, I'm trying to analyze how I can write like a, a pop hit, you know, very yeah. analytical. Mm -hmm. We're looking through the billboard. We're looking through stuff mm -hmm. and, and we're trying to figure out how we can write something good. And he's looking at, let's say Drake, right. As a reference, mm -hmm. I want to write a song like Drake. And I was like, dude, like, I don't know if you can necessarily look at Drake and be like, this is what I got to do. Because when you start looking at these pop stars now, like the top, uh, the top mm -hmm. dogs, the industry, whatever, like they can like, just shit on the floor and it'll sell a million albums because they have an entire apparatus behind them and all kinds of money. You got to almost be looking at the people that don't have that apparatus that are getting. I don't believe that though. You don't think? I know. Like, I, I know for, I know for a fact. Um, there's a, a writer who writes top lines named Pooh Bear. Mm -hmm. And um, he had collaborated with uh, Justin Bieber for songs and they wrote over 101 songs. And uh, I think it was the 101 or 100, the 100th song was a, a hit. That was the one that was a hit. That they were like, we're going to do this. No, no, no. It wasn't, the, we're going to do this. It was the only one that made the, cut. the freaking cutting right. room floor. And that was the only one that was, that was a hit. They had released other things, but then none of, none of those, you know, I just feel like sometimes when I hear like, um, you remember that Ariana Grande album, the one that had God is a woman, right. like I'm listening yeah. to God is a woman. And I'm like, this is such a beautifully written song that I'm not entirely sure if it wasn't Ariana Grande that released that, if it would have that much, cause it's not following the mold. There is no mold. It's right. just like this really beautifully orchestrated piece of art. And I'm like, I don't know if, if I was a record label head that that somebody right. brought that to me that has no clout whatsoever, that right. I would be like, yeah, that's the one. I understand what you mean because there's a there's a part of the music industry where people actually let you hear something. And because of the ability to be able to record now on your own in project rooms and people actually really learning the, the techniques on how to mix records, things are just sounding amazing. But is there a song there? So that's the hard part is first clicking, hearing the production value and saying, wow, this sounds freaking awesome. But then trying to pay attention. What's the story? Is it moving me? Are the lyrics moving me? Is this actually a story about something that I can relate to? That's the difference between a song going big, big, or a song just going a little right. blip. I think most people just give a shit about the blip. 
nowadays. nowadays. They're just like attention span. They're like, I just want any attention is good attention, right? right. Any, any, uh, any yeah, any any but publicity is, that, is good is publicity. Is that really just for the artist, or is it also a little bit for us as listeners? We just want that like dopamine hit. Well, maybe uh, 50, 50. Uh, uh, you, you think fifty fifty? I, I if you look at the, the top forty Billboard, or let's let's narrow it down. Top one hundred. Uh, top. Let's look at top five songs. Right. What are the top five songs on Billboard? Here, let's check it out. Let's go. We're doing this. Top no idea. top five songs. I was actually super impressed. There was this. Uh, there was a Spanish song that I saw the other day that was like number two. It's like uh, cor corridos is something that's popping off right now. It's like this. Uh, we're talking about the Billboard. We're talking about yeah. the Billboard. You know. Yeah. This is this is actual numbers. This is not where people are just streaming. Oh this is God. where people are putting their money. That's where they're put their, putting their money. So for me, B Billboard is is the is really the place where you see ah this is where the real data shows right. what people like. You don't think that has something to do with just like marketing no power? Like, yeah, like marketing power. Like, I'll give you an example. Obviously, like if, there's more marketing power to be able to push uh, uh, a, an artist. But at the end of the day, is it going to actually rise to the top if it's not a good song? You could try to push. There are... Right. Uh, you know how many labels do a six-month... Pro promotional deal um, to actually push the song and they go, we're going to push this. We're putting $2 million for the next six months to push. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Right. Ben, ben, I was in, Clive Davis uh, uh, put it on the show, put it on actually, uh, I think it was Kiss uh, in New York, put it on for two weeks. They did a little push. They didn't right, get no so, response. So I guess the- Hold the, it. Shelved it. The thing is, if you get onto the billboard right. in and of itself, that could just be a marketing thing. Staying there and not just dropping down and dropping off is the hard part. So should we play a game like, is this a song or is it not? <laughs> <laughs> is it a song or is it not? So billboard, top mm -hmm. billboard right now, uh, Vampire, oh. Olivia Rodrigo. Nice. Number one. So you don't know Olivia Rodrigo? She had that no, driver's license she song? Is. Oh, you don't know the song? No. Yeah, me neither. No, I listened to it. I listened to the billboard the other day because I was just going through it. So, so isn't that interesting? We have demographics. Different. And different age groups. Yeah. Back in the day, I knew what the number one song was. You didn't have a choice. Radio was pounding it down your right. throat. We are shoved with so much material on social media, we don't even know what the number one song in the country is. Which I like, I think. It's like, you don't have to be at the whim of, like who the, it's it's been like, this is the only, you know, the radio, that was the only way that you could, unless you're buying records and you're playing them on your vinyl at home or you're buying the tapes or you're buying the CDs, like you only have to listen to the records, right? Now you have not only Spotify and not only iTunes, which, you know, fucking pay your artists more, but whatever, but we get, we'll get into that <laughs> another time. Um, but you have an algorithm that's curated for you. Oh, by the way, you like that. So that's like the, once again, blessing and the curse. Harder for you to pierce as a pop star. Mm -hmm. Curse. Blessing. That's, you have like these bands that are coming out of nowhere. And I, I explained that to someone the other day where I was like, oh, you want to be like Justin Bieber? Why don't you just want to sell out like M. Tellus, like 3,000 seats? If you sell out 3,000 seats, if you could just sell out 3,000 seats, you can make a living oh playing God. fucking two shows a year, oh yeah. but you want to make $50 million playing stadiums like Justin Bieber sure. play the lottery. Sure. It's like, now I think with Spotify and with iTunes and mm -hmm. the fact that the algorithm we don't give a shit about the billboard. You have way more bands that are selling out the M2. Maybe one, you know, one one show a year, but they're playing little things and they're making their living through that, which I think is really cool. And there are bands that are doing 500 seaters to 1,000 seaters cr doing cross-country tours. Exactly. And they're, they're the ones that are actually surviving off of their music. It's expensive Wonderful. as hell to actually go on tour and, you know, only only do, you know, 500, you know, seats but uh, and 1,000 seats. But it's realistic to be able to, I think that's more realistic than trying to be no, in you Ariana that. Grande. Yeah. Do that's, you love music or do you love your ego? Do yeah. you love the the being a pop star? Which go. one do you want to be? And that's why it's like you said, if you have a good song that's talking to people, write for yourself, sure. Don't come up to me and tell me that you want to be this plastic pop star billboard fabricated thing mm -hmm. and not play the game like that mm -hmm. and not do the formula bullshit and mm -hmm. do all of that. You I know feel like I mean? I'm not a music lover. Because I don't listen to the radio at all. I can't. Like, 
Yeah, I, like, I, I listen like, to Vermont Public. I feel I like if that. you were to name me these five songs, whatever the five are, same. I bet you they're the same five songs that play like on a loop at the hour, every single hour, right. all day long, minus like if it's like, I don't know what they're called now, like Virgin Radio is like Mix 96. That's how long I haven't listened to the radio for. Virgin. Yeah, And they I have like that. the cool like disco at like eight o'clock, right. you know, which is like fun. But I stopped listening because... I remember I used to work and it took me like two hours to get home in the car. I used to work far and I would literally hear the same set of songs, Mm -hmm. like recycle themselves. Sure. Sure. And I'm like, I can't hear anything new. I can't hear anything that's not like billboard top 10. Like I can't hear anything else. Mm -hmm. So I can't discover anything else. I can't feel anything else. Well, that's great that now we have the ability to be able to listen to music on all kinds of different platforms. But how do you, how do you sift through the noise and get to the good stuff? Is it through, oh, listening to one artist and then maybe actually doing a little bit of, you know, work to search mm-hmm. and go, other people listen to such and such. Other people listen to such and such yeah. and clicking on it and listen. I, I think their algorithms are pretty good with like, I know in particular Spotify has like, here's your mix for X, Y, Z. And sometimes mm-hmm. it'll be a genre mix where it's like, this is hip hop that you might like. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it might be an artist mix. Like this is uh, J. Cole that you might mm-hmm. like. And it's a J. Cole mix and it's not all just J. Cole, but it's people that fit in the thing. You're going to have to do some research. Because I was going to say, don't you feel like you get a little bit like pigeonholed though? into like one kind of like genre or style. For sure. That's when you, in my, this is why I love doing this. Um, I just love hearing other people's music tastes. I always bond over music. I'm always talking to other people, asking what they're listening to Mm -hmm. and what they're, and like, you Mm -hmm. know, some people are shy about their music, but you got to share music, man. Music is a, it's a cultural, it's a, it's a community. You could get pigeonholed if you want to stay in your, in your own headspace, but Mm -hmm. learning what other people like, I think is really I like, yeah, to be shown, like, other music, but I also like listening to, I like finding stuff that makes me feel a certain way, and then I like to listen to it till I hate it. Right, (laughs) yeah. And then I find the next song. Everybody. (laughs) The first time that I ever experienced um, people sharing music and listening to music that that I probably would have never heard was when LimeWire, after Napster got shut down, then there was LimeWire that came out. And it was the first time that I went through folders and there were people's folders from some guy in Boston. And I could actually go into that folder, into his playlist and listen to the songs that he was listening to. And I, I couldn't believe the array of different genres like this person, one particular person was listening to. So that that gave me the inclination of like, wow, okay, this this is not just me that just likes a lot of different styles of music. Mm-hmm. And it's not just myself that's disheartened with the direction of certain radio stations that are only playing one genre. Is are there radio stations that are not getting it that people like a lot of different styles of music? Or is it the majority of people stick to one genre of music? Well, what do you think that is? You know what? I think sometimes we forget because we're so in the thick of it because everyone over here is an artist. So we just appreciate art regardless. But there's some people that just don't fucking, they don't like music. They just don't like music. For them, music is like a bite size, the radio, mm-hmm. the party, the club, the whatever. They might not listen to music in their, in their headphones. They don't give a crap. They don't. I've met a couple of people like that and I'm yeah, but shocked. I'm, yeah, but I'm talking about the people that do like music. Do you think there's a more mass majority of our uh, people that are listening to radio and radio stations because of the genre of music that they're playing? Or do you think there's a bigger population of people that are more uh, up to listening to streaming platforms because there's more array of variety that they can create their own playlist. Oh, yeah. it's definitely I the go second with that one. one. Yeah, right. I don't think anybody listens to the radio except for the people who don't give a shit about music. The right. ones that are just like, this is They're just listening to its noise in the background. The thing I know is like any of the people that I'm close with, they're all on all the streaming platforms because they want to have the variety, but a lot of them are listening to music not from right now. And that doesn't mean like 60s, 70s, 80s, but that even just means like earlier 2000s, like late 90s. Um, I'm wondering, maybe, I don't know, it's just like the direction that the world is going in and everything is chaos and everything is awful all the time. Um, People really like nostalgia. 
Mm. Yeah. That, like, that's, to be mm, reminded sure. and brought back to music that makes them feel, like, cozy mm. and you know where that You know where that comes from? No. It's actually depression. <laughs> well, <laughs> color me pink. I actually, know. nostalgia. If you actually look up- I know like, it's like an illness. It, it, the definition of nostalgia was defined back in, like, the- the 50s and 60s was depression, a form of depression, because you felt that there was an era in your life was, was the better. best time of your life and everything else is, oh, it'll never be like that again. Damn. Albert, I am going to talk to my therapist about Holy you. Holy shit. I don't well, know this is therapist. why this is couch sessions. Yeah, so, exactly. We're just you know, being we're, we're at the right place for this. Sad boy vibes. Okay? Oh. So, so yes, I think a lot of the people that I know mm -hmm. that listen to and they're stuck listening to 80s or 90s music are very nostalgic. There, there is a period in their life that went and has passed and they're, they're, not, they're not content with the direction of where their lives have gone. I think there's a huge correlation with people that are unhappy with their lives that listen to strictly... 80s, 90s music. I honestly wouldn't. No, I'm not looking at you. No, you listen to I, everything, bro. I do listen to everything. But I was going to say, but then, I mean, I do listen to a lot of stuff, you know, that brings me back to like times in my life. Mm, like, great. Oh, best times, right? Better sometimes. All the time. But oh, what about <laughs> someone like me? Like, I love the 80s. I don't care if it's pop, rock. Like, I don't care. I love mm -hmm. the 80s. Mm -hmm. I was not alive in the 80s. So what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Why am I why am I so well, drawn to a time that I did not partake in? Did you listen to it in high school? Cuz I think high school is the of course. is your yeah, comfort Yeah, but also ship. No, growing up. I mean, I did have a little bit of 80s growing up, like Michael Jackson and stuff like that, mm -hmm. but my parents actually raised me a lot on Motown. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's not the 80s. <laughs> nah, Motown, Less Town, whatever. No, the Motown is the sound. 70s, yeah. No, I 60s, know, like, 70s, yeah. Uh, Motown, there was some ABBA in there. A lot of ABBA. Yeah. Okay. And Def then Michael. Definitely 70s, yeah. But then, no, like, I'm like, I like Madonna and The Crew and Def Leppard and Alice Cooper and Maybe Joe you're Jett. nostalgic in a way where you wish that you lived during right. that era and not now. I think that's, I mean, oh! a lot of times that's what happens. Yeah. Deep, oh my deep, god. Deep, <laughs> deep, 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 deep. This motherfucker is a therapist. No? You know what I'm saying? Maybe. <laughs> no, I think I think it's a cultural thing. You know what I mean? Like what do you want to out of your out of your, you know, out of like your culture and your community and stuff like that and that'll influence. So maybe the people that you were hanging around were listening to that shit. I don't know. I think that when I listen to like 80s music, I imagine myself, you know, driving with the top down, it's California and it's mm, warm right. and mm. life feels Better. Nice yeah, better. better. And grass fun. is greener, right? Grass is greener. Grass, in the 80s. grass is greener well, on the other listen, side. While our forests are on fire and so are the oceans. <laughs> Did yeah. I listen to the 80s and I'm like, fuck, this synth sound sounds so garbage. I have the same sounds on my Yamaha at fucking home. <laughs> That's what I hear when I hear 80s. I'm like, what is that? Like, like owner of a lonely heart? You know that the uh -huh. orchestra hit? Uh -huh. That's a uh -huh. stock orchestra hit sound that you get off of a $10 fucking keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it was just pitch shifting the fucking thing yeah. upwards. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I don't know. I also I so no I, nostalgia. I like your, nostalgia. It just depends on what you know. I think I also have just like a lot of respect for the musicians and industry folk from that time because as we keep discussing, things right now are very accessible, and back then it was quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, you were working with instruments that I don't think I've even touched or seen in my life, mm -hmm. and trying to imagine how you made those records possible, mm -hmm. how they made those records possible, is like mind-blowing to right. me. Right. Let's get something straight. I was not saying that the music from the 80s is um, unsuperior to anything. I'm saying that if you are the type of person mm -hmm. that strictly listens to strictly. 80s, strictly but listens to 80s and 90s, I feel that that nostalgia is falling into the depression. No, no, but uh, the caveat definition. is that they need to have lived through those eras. I think that you're right. If you live through the 80s and 90s yes. and you're still stuck in that yes. moment, then that might be depression. But if you're like, let's say, if it's your past life, it's fine. Yeah, okay. like if you didn't grow, like because a hundred percent, you know, I was listening to a. Who the fuck was it? It was Joe Walsh. It was just like a random mm. TikTok of mm -hmm. Joe Walsh. He was like, I wouldn't be too worried about AI. And he's like, 
I wouldn't be worried about AI. Can AI throw a fucking television off the third fucking story of a balcony into a pool right in the middle? And I was like, what the fuck does that have to do with music, bro? Rock and roll. You know what I mean? And I've heard that from people. I was listening to like one of my dad's friends talking at like Christmas parties. He's like, this is the fucking day. You know, he's listening to like smoking in the boys' room. He's like, back in the day, you could fucking smoke in the bathroom. I'm like, that's what the fuck you miss? Is smoking in the fucking bathroom? Cancer. What the hell is that? And it is. It's so much like, it's not it's the high same school. anymore. You it was called I mean? Block C in my high school. And Yo, people same. used to like smoke, you know, it's like. Uh, we went to the same high school, not at the same time. That's right. Clearly. Definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Block C was before your, your era. That was the, that was the smoking that zone. Hilarious. Oh but God. I just get like so vexed it's cause like these same people are also like anyway. one it's hilarious because first of all it's smoking indoors second it's hilarious cause it's high school students <laughs> smoking like those were the days <laughs> those were the days and I'm like I don't know <laughs> I'm like I don't know about that and it's always like and that's why I'm not like it's not that I don't think that like you know, music from the 70s and 80s was was obviously fantastic. Most of my favorite music comes mm -hmm. from those eras. Sure. You know what I mean? I'm, uh, like what I'm saying? But when I hear older folks say music just like, like everything was good back in the days, like, no, there was like well, a ton of garbage back in the 70s and 80s. Of course, like, of course. Was, 90s was actually a really bad <laughs> It's yeah, a bad decade for music, actually. You know, and you're like, but it's there's always been trash. You just look, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, you're looking sure. back at it. Fun. Maybe sure. it's because we weren't so uh, connected to it all the time. Sure. I mean, now like we literally carry uh, computers with us everywhere, mm -hmm. like just yeah. you know from our phones, uh, tablets, our watches are connected. Like we're always constantly connected to everything mm -hmm. and everyone in the world to a point that we're kind of becoming disconnected mm -hmm. from each other. Mm -hmm. right. um, and this is also another theme that comes up with like a lot of the people that we, the artists that we talk to, maybe like, that's it. Like, like those were maybe simpler times where we were able to really be an active part of our life. Mm. Whereas now we're constantly bombarded all the time. But to say that music today, if somebody from a different, um, a past era right. uh, listens to what's playing on on Spotify or whatever list playlist that they're listening to, and they say everything that comes out now today is crap. That's a big statement. That's a huge statement. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you you got Bold. Thundercat, you got Alan Stone, you got uh, Anderson Pack that came out. Like, are those... Are those crappy artists? Like, come so maybe on. they mean though no, love. mainstream. So I think they're thinking of a genre more than like often. A, they are thinking of a genre mm -hmm. that they don't specifically like, and they just put it all in one box, like right. most people do. They do one. They see one person of one race or one religion. They put them all in a nice box to make it easy to define. Like, because oh, damn. because to be able to actually like go and. <laughs> define each one and to actually do some research on each. That's a lot of work. Yeah. Let's just throw it in a box. Yeah. Call it one thing. Crap. Whatever. <laughs> you know? And just call, and it, call, call it call it a day. day. Call, call it a day. Call it even. It's done. Fuck Music it. today is all crap. <laughs> exactly. And you know what they're I thinking? You made that parallel to like racism. Like that's so true. <laughs> it's it's an exact the parallel. <laughs> it's a and it's an exact parallel right. to uh actually being prejudiced towards other types of music. Let's say back at those simpler times, uh, you know, 60s and 70s and 80s. Um, the simpler let, times simpler, for who? <laughs> I know. But I'm saying, yeah, um, <laughs> like when metal started uh -oh. to become a thing. <laughs> right. People were outraged and the whole satanic panic happened. Sure. Like you said, they put anything that sounds kind of right. like this now goes into a box, devil worship. They didn't even need metal. It was Rolling Stones. It was Led Zeppelin. Play the record backwards. They didn't need it to go yeah. even that heavy and that crazy and that dark. Uh, they just needed to make music darker and darker because, oh, you want to hear what the devil's got to say? We, we, we'll show you what the yeah, devil's got I to love say. That. <laughs> Just fucking stealing fucking black culture since the 60s. Let's go. Every <laughs> no, fucking before artist that. forever. Before, yeah, that. before that. Yeah, way before that. No, no, but like mainstream music, stealing yeah, of course. fucking black artist music uh, is. Yeah, but that's, that's been that's happening for is. a while. You know? All the time. You ever hear that story about like the Verve and Bittersweet Symphony where mm -hmm. it's like, where it's like they own the publishing 
to so basically for if you if you're watching this and you don't know they had taken a rolling stone song and made an orchestral arrangement for it which the verve sampled okay mm -hmm. and they got sued by the pub, the the holders of the publishing for that orchestral song but that original song from the stones was literally stealing also some, sampled a sampled from a fucking artist from the 40s who was black <laughs> and they didn't get shit from that dude sorry <laughs> okay so it's hilarious so, so we're talking about technology we're talking about stealing and then you mentioned ai and i keep talking about this mm. i don't know if you're up to date like in the news with everything that's happening um with the Actors Guild, oh, I'm hip. with the writers, and how they're trying to basically have AI replace people's jobs. Yeah. And I keep bringing up to Albert, when do you think this is going to hit us? Mm. Um, I've been seeing like all over TikTok and even Instagram, um, people are starting to make like AI versions of like Drake, of Ariana Grande. And it's, you can tell it's not it's not 100 percent that, but it's very very. What's well, gonna get there? It's gonna get. And there. I'm wondering if we're gonna end up. If you think we're gonna end up in like a Black Mirror episode, where we don't even like we just get rid of the artist, use their likeness, and just make it's a money machine. Dude, isn't it funny? Because I saw a meme the other day that was like, I always thought that AI would get rid of the menial jobs so that we can all concentrate on art, not like the fucking opposite, like take over yeah. art and make us do the menial work. Except. They tried this. They had a robot and they put it into like manual labor to do the same, like so many tasks. And the robot it was like, off itself. Kill me. <laughs> it offed itself. It literally, it. there's video and it was like, nope. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Refusal. Like, what the fuck? Pay me fairly. You're like, dude, what the? You're a fucking robot. He's like, I have kids. <laughs> the cost of living is going up, but wages haven't increased. What the hell? So Why are the politicians going on 50 to 60 vacations a year? Where is this money coming from? But I hit a pothole on my way to fucking work the other. Sorry. <laughs> we just took it so they're taking the artistic jobs. Yeah. Um, what do we think that's going to do to the music industry? If we're already saying that music has lost some of its heart, it's becoming like a money machine, especially for the, you know, the big executives. Mm -hmm. What do we think that AI is going to do to it? I think at one point there's going to be technology that's going to be implemented where we're going to have to have fingerprints on our voice, voices, oh. DNA, Ooh. DNA Hot matching cake algorithms like to prove it is to who it prove is. that it is who it is because there's already situations where people are using people's voices like for voices you know a deep face but also people's voices to uh to do advertising for example mm. i was just listening to uh, a newscast on this gentleman that did a voiceover 20 years ago and he had signed a release form right for the recording and they were allowed to use his voice, however, see fit his voice of the recording. But now somebody had taken his voice and they were able to AI it and use his voice for another commercial. So we're just going to use it in, per in per 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 perpetuity. Yes. So now they're using, now they took his voice, sampled his voice, and now used his voice for uh, a commercial. And of course, he's not getting paid. Of course not. Because right. now he had, si he had signed off. Figure. So now we have to be careful on what we're signing off, especially even on social media sites, whether it's Facebook and everything. Nobody's reading the fine, fine print anymore at the bottom. No, we release it's crazy. We release all rights to our voice, our pictures. The day, take every everybody goes on Facebook and Instagram and oh just goes. God. I just want to be in. I just, I just want to be in, and they have no idea. I just want to see the, thirst traps. Yeah, I wonder Fuck. if we're gonna see like kind of as we get more technologically advanced. I wonder if we're gonna see parts of civilization kind of go backwards. Where we start to like log off and start to reconnect, yeah. make music together. I hope it'll it'll definitely get to the point where it's in to be off. Mm. It's just, always it's always been like that, right? There's just, always been there's a, a certain sector of people. There's a certain who, sector yeah, of people. Counterculture. Yeah. Right. But although I have to say that people in their mobile devices and things, that's just as addictive as any type of addiction that I've ever seen oh, in my life. It's not so more. Well, they've done they, studies on this. Yeah. They said the the lighting up of the phone, it's the dopamine hit that you want. Yeah. And people right. become addicted to that. Yeah. Yeah. I have to admit, there are times where I'm watching a movie. And I am distracted by yep. scroll, scrolling through my phone while I'm watching a movie. 
Maybe because the movie fucking sucks. No, it's the light. I have to flip my phone over like, oh my so God. that I can't see the light in the corner. Can't of my see eye. the little messages popping up, right. you know, and whatnot. There might be a conversation going on in the group chat of the studios, and I'm like, oh, what's going on? And then I start scrolling through. It's just another excuse yep. to go. Right. Well, what else is on there? I got a movie going on. That's what's going yeah, on exactly. right there. This you know, it's be like my relaxation. You know, and as focus. and as I look to my right. Oh, who are you? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> now that I didn't even I, realize there's somebody. I didn't even room. realize there's somebody in the room with me. <laughs> so it gets to the point oh, where you're is. you're so distracted, right? That it just it, it it's it, there really needs to be a little bit more more focus. So so if we're talking about music and mm-hmm. trying to focus in on where we're finding music, where we're shifting towards music and actually getting back to artists, being able to narrow in on their art and having, you know, more ex- better expectations of what can come from their music and understanding that the love of the music is why you should be doing it. I think just all of these things need to be just like narrowed and focused and a, a little a bit, bit more, more, yeah, stripped down and clear, Right. Maybe we need to have some writers camps here. That'd be super fun. Yes. Just get together and jam and play. You know, absolutely. And write, you know, absolutely. write music. Because one of the things that gets me really, maybe it's just Montreal, maybe it's everywhere in the goddamn world. I don't like the clickiness that mm-hmm. that happens with stuff. When it comes to these writers camps, there's a lot of like, if you know, you know, and if you don't, you don't. And it's always the mm-hmm. same cast of people. I was trying to say, the only ones that I've heard of, it's been like industry. Yeah, it's always, no, it's always no, super. Not, not necessarily. There's a lot of independent um, songwriters within Montreal that go to these writers camps, yeah. uh, writers camps that, that I've seen. And there's nothing wrong with them. I, 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 I think that they seek out these opportunities to go out and to do them. And I think a lot of us think for some reason that they should be knocking on our door. No, no, you got to go out there. You got to go out there and you got to be in there. It's like whenever I've gone to a a record launch or a a CD release or friends of ours that are in town that are, that are playing, um, I see the same similar people, but I have a feeling that they're out there way more than I am. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're they are. And they're out, out there. there schmoozing and talking right. and it's the same click of people. We have our click of people at the studios here. And a lot of them, it's yes, I see all of our clients, but I'm never in the thick of it mm-hmm. because I don't go to a lot of uh, CD launches unless it's record that I've worked on or if it's friends of ours that are in town that or records that we've worked on, you know, with, right. w- w- for, for clients. But in general, it's a, it's a community and it's like going to church. Everybody that goes to these events and all of these SOCAN awards and so get, they're all there going to church. Right. That's their, com- that's their that's community. What you, that's what you got to do. That's what you got to do. And if you want to be part of that community, well, then you got to, you got to yeah. go to, you got no go to gonna, you gotta go to church. No one's going to go and lift you up and be like, Hey, do you want to be a part of this really cool thing that we're doing? I think that's what I mean. Though. I exactly. think maybe we need like, uh, what is it? Like bass bin jam sesh. Yeah, you think? I think I think there's enough jam sessions, but I think that there's um, a good place to be able to uh, do writers camps and to do things like that, where where we're actually showing them the process, and like I said, the expectations of what you're expecting to to come out with. Mm-hmm. And um, showing them all the positive sides, but also explaining to them the negative parts of the industry and the reasons why you should be doing it and the reasons why you shouldn't be doing it. For you two, I know for me, the answer is yes. When you tell people, I'm a sound engineer, I'm a producer, I work in the industry, whatever it is, do people who are not in the industry look at you and think that that's glamorous? What my girlfriend thinks I do at the studio pictures. Yeah. What yeah. I do in the studio yeah, picture. They always think it's super dope. It's like I did, so. like I, I told someone, I was like, yeah, I was working at F1, the Ritz Carlton. They're like, oh my God, that's so dope. Meanwhile, I'm there at fucking seven in the morning, fucking schlepping cables. Fucking the thing's gonna fall. We need to do to this. You know what I mean? Doing like all kinds of stupid, like it wasn't fun, dude. I got two hours of sleep, but I was at, you know what I mean? Like I was working at F1 doing like blah, 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 whatever. So it's all optics. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And yeah. it's the same thing with, with music. It's like, it is it is glamorous. Like, it's fun. Like, the studio downstairs over here at Basement Studios located in Montreal on Frontenac <laughs> are, like, super beautiful and super, like, nice to be around. So it looks glamorous. But the work... Isn't always. 
comping vocals for four hours crying because i've been like (laughs) editing a podcast for the last like four hours and my computer decided to like shut down is not fun Mm -hmm. like it's it's a job like anything else so you know what i mean it's not always and not every time that you have that's i think we were talking about this earlier but not every time that you get into the studio and you're doing a writing thing and you're producing for a client or you're writing a song or you're doing xyz it's not always going to be great it's not always going to be a hit it's not you come in and it's like this effect that happens we're passing around champagne and everyone's having a yeah exactly that's not it a lot of the times it's like okay well we tried our best today and you know we opened up the shop and nobody came through the shop and then some days you open up the shop and there's life and people are buying your shit but you got to open up the shop every day it's just that not every day is like a a record not every day is a, a big party i think the thing is is at the end of the day as long as you're surrounded by the things that make you happy and you have to look around because sometimes you might be comping a vocal and you might be like tuning tuning somebody's you know track and you might look around and go, eh, I'm not working at a shoe store, right? This could it's be worse. Okay. It could be could be worse, <laughs> you know. So today is doing this, and today is tomorrow is probably doing you're doing something else. I think at the end of the day, you have to make you have to make choices and what you want to do with your career. And yes, if you're an artist and you're a singer songwriter type artist it's going to be it's going to be tough it's going to be a tough grind and yeah. it, you better be prepared to plant your feet and to take you know the hit because mm-hmm. it's not going to be easy if that's all you want to do i i i personally built a studio where there's so many different facets for me to be able to do what i love mm-hmm. that all that involves everything that has to do with music so I didn't want to leave my industry. That was my number one focus. And I said, if I, if I do open something, it's to be able to not have to work outside of my industry. Right. Yeah. Cause it's like, even if I'm not singing today, I'm still doing something that pertains. Yeah, That's That's right. That comes from a love for music. And that's why I said before, not everybody loves music. Not every, every, some people like the fame and the glitz and the glamour and like the being a center of attention. Right. Not everyone loves the art and you got to love the art. Perfect example. I mean, we, we've known of, of people that have, um, came, come out with albums and, successful, relatively successful records. They went on to have a relatively successful career, but they were not happy with performing. They didn't enjoy performing live. And then it brought them to the, to the brink of that's that I can't do this anymore. Right. Like, like to the point of, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm out. It's, it's strange how some people love music but it's almost like therapy and it's just really something for them. And, but they're, they're pressured into, you should be on stage. You should be performing. Yeah. You should be. You should turn this into a career. You should t- turn this into a career. And the person's like, oh, really? Because I just like, I really like just yeah. doing this for myself. This is my and I therapy. Enjoy. Yeah. Okay I like, just I like, to love it. Yeah. I, right. It's okay just to love it and not seek, you know, fame and fortune. And, and you know, but if you want to work in the industry, it doesn't just stem around you being a performer and being on stage and being a star. All of a sudden, if you're writing songs and you've never gotten picked up as an artist and whatnot, you're still writing songs. Keep writing songs. Write songs for other people. Why, why is there anything wrong with that? That's right. That's, that's, that's the thing. And a lot of people, it's because of the ego. They're like, no, if I'm not singing my songs, I don't want to do it. And then it's like, well, then maybe maybe this isn't for you. You know what I mean? Maybe right. this industry isn't for you. Right. Maybe Maybe there's like other things that you should be doing if you don't really isn't it isn't there irony though in that and saying no i want to sing my songs i want to sing my song my songs well if you want to sing your songs and it's all about you you need to go sing your songs in your room and yeah then why are you why are you forcing why, me to listen to it why are you <laughs> <laughs> why are you forcing what? it yeah don't if you don't want to share yeah your art and you don't want to share what you do then but then then just stay at home yeah no one's forcing and you to post it on instagram positive way to tie this all up is do what you love, love what you do. Not everything has to be a career, but if it does become a career, I, yeah, like I said, just love what you do. Yeah, and if the AI overtakes over, I just want to say, kill me first. <laughs> you thought I was gonna what? You thought I was gonna suck up to the robots and be like, don't kill me. If y'all take over, fucking end me. I don't give a shit. R two D two. Anyway, <laughs> that's what I feel about fucking AI. 
Join us next time on our couch <laughs> sessions. If you can relate to any of these frustrations, comment, like, subscribe, and we'll continue these conversations more in the future. Yeah. Bye. Goodbye. Basement TV.